This is reposted from Dolly Weber's Song of the Bride YouTube channel. The magic language used by the Jews. The Jews have convinced the world to call that language Hebrew, but their language is no more Hebrew than it is Swedish, Italian, or even Pig Latin, and I'm about to show you. By the time Jesus came to earth, the only Old Testament scrolls to survive were Greek scrolls that had been translated from the actual Hebrew scrolls about 2,500 years ago. The translation project was critical because the authentic Hebrew scrolls were hundreds of years old and literally falling apart. So the Old Testament scrolls translated into Greek were the only copy of the original Old Testament scrolls that anyone would have from there on in. The authentic Hebrew scrolls would never be seen again. As the Hebrew scrolls were aging, the Hebrew language was aging and even becoming extinct. The Jews gradually stopped speaking the language starting about 400 years before Jesus, and they took on the ways and languages of the people around them. By the time Jesus arrived, no one had been speaking authentic Hebrew. Hebrew for 200 years. When Jesus came, the Jews in Judea spoke Aramaic, which is not Hebrew. The Jews outside of Judea spoke Greek, along with practically everyone else. Jesus spoke Greek most of the time when he ministered and also used those Greek scrolls called the Septuagint to read. Jesus also knew Aramaic and occasionally used Aramaic phrases at key events in his life and ministry, such as when he raised a girl from the dead. And just before taking his last breath on the cross, he said, Lama, Lama, Sabachthani, which meant, for this purpose I came. It did not mean, why have you forsaken me, Father, as the phrase has erroneously been translated. After Jesus returned to heaven, the same Jewish rabbis who had killed Jesus continued to plot against him. They maintained their positions of leadership in Jerusalem and established many Talmudic academies, as we already heard. Through their academies, they wrote down all of those wicked laws and traditions and constructed the writings we call the Talmud. Those Talmudic Jewish rabbis hated the Septuagint because the Septuagint presented the prophet's descriptions of the coming Messiah, and those descriptions clearly pointed to Jesus. The rabbis knew that if the Jewish people started reading the Septuagint, they would know that Jesus was the Messiah, and that would not make those rabbis very happy. So those rabbis came up with a plan to make their own Old Testament. That way, they could chop up the content in the Septuagint, discard and change all those annoying references to Jesus, and then present the finished product in a whole new book of their own. They also decided to create a new language so they could write down their new book in their own magical way. The Talmudic rabbis started their new alphabet by first taking the letters of the Aramaic alphabet and then adding a whole assortment of special dots and points and even a few magical decorations called amulets. Now, those rabbis could accommodate any interest in the Old Testament by offering their own chop-chop version and erroneously say that it was Hebrew besides. I think we could call this an early instance of controlled opposition. Don't tell the people not to read the Old Testament. Just keep them away from the real version and the accurate version by offering them your chop-chop version to read instead. No doubt those Kabbalist rabbis had no real interest in the true contents of the Old Testament anyway. They had little regard for the prophets, and according to Jesus, didn't even follow Moses like they claimed. Remember when Jesus told the Pharisees, if you truly followed Moses, then you would believe me, because Moses wrote about me. The entire task to make up the language and copy down all of the chop-chop Old Testament would last nearly nine centuries. But the foundation for this new work was laid down by three Talmudic Kabbalist rabbis. First, Rabbi Akiva, a highly revered Talmudic rabbi that Jews refer to as chief of the sages. He was a leading contributor to the Talmud itself and a principal founder of rabbinic Judaism. He also loved doing the chop-chop cleanup of the Septuagint's references to Jesus because Rabbi Akiva hated Jesus with a passion. 
Next came Rabbi Aquila of Sinope. Initially converting from paganism to Christianity, Rabbi Aquila's devout love for astrology led him to reject Jesus and move on to Judaism. There, Aquila and his love for astrology fit right in to make him become a Talmudic Jew and work as a student under Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Aquila gladly helped Akiva in his Chop Chop project of the Septuagint, and he also put his Kabbalist talents to work by starting to sorcerize those Aramaic letters. Aquila devised a system of points and dots and literal amulets or charms that were called crowns, according to the Zohar. He added those crowns to Aramaic letters and thus began the process of filling the letters and the text with sorcery. If you put the Aramaic letters and the letters of the new magic language side by side, you can see that the new letters were only a modification of Aramaic letters. Aramaic is not Hebrew, and neither was the new language those rabbis were making up, even though they wanted everybody to think it was Hebrew. In the book of creation from the Zohar, Sefer Yetzirah, the same book that tells us the creator created by saying abracadabra, we actually read the Kabbalist instructions and beliefs behind those changes the rabbis were making to the Aramaic letters. Amulets, by definition, have special powers to protect or bring good fortune, and good Kabbalists attach amulets even to letters, in this case, crowns, in order to give those letters themselves actual demonic power. Such was the nature of what the Kabbalist rabbis did to create a set of 22 letters that would not only be used by Talmudic rabbis for their chop-chop version of the Old Testament, but that same language would become the most widely used language by magicians in the 21st century Western world. Truly, those Kabbalist rabbis accomplished what they set out to do. They made a language not mirrored after speech, but created solely for the purpose of making a magical language for occult use and also to present their Chop Chop Old Testament. Rabbi Aquila finished his thing in 130 AD and then came along Rabbi Yose ben Halfta to put the finishing touches on the project. He was one of Akiva's top five students and also impressively studied under the main writer of that greatly revered book called the Zohar. Rabbi Yossi even sat on the Sanhedrin. So with great occult knowledge and power of his own, this last rabbi perfected and standardized the language with all of its dots and points and magical crowns. The language was constructed, engineered, and made from scratch. It was not made to record a spoken language like all other languages. This one was different, and no one could even speak it for 2,000 years after they started to make it up. If you would like to cross-check all of this, I invite you to listen to the following rabbi, whose statements confirm what hidden history shows us. But today's popular narrative leaves out. But when you realize that these are just grammatical decisions, the way the language was constructed, the way the language was constructed, constructed. The story of Hebrew in the 20th century is the amazing story of an engineered language mm -hmm. where people decided that they were going to create a language almost out of nothing. The story of Hebrew in the 20th century is the amazing story of an engineered language. Mm -hmm. An engineered language. Mm -hmm. Where people decided that they were going to create create a language almost out of nothing. It wasn't a spoken language. And in 1924, when the Technion was opened in Israel, the decision was originally made that classes would be taught in German because that was the only thing that made sense. Because how in the world are you going to teach sciences mm -hmm. in Hebrew when the professors don't know Hebrew and the students don't know Hebrew? And, and people forced them. The Zionist movement said it's impossible uh, yeah. to open a school that's going to be in German. And so, you know, they struggled and they created it. From around the year one, until the year 1900, right. there was hardly anybody in the world mm -hmm. who was speaking Hebrew mm -hmm. on, a, uh, on a regular basis. After the foundation for a new engineered language was carefully laid by 160 AD, more and more Talmudic rabbis called Masoretes continued to work on the chopped up Septuagint text and continued writing it into the new magical language for a few centuries afterwards. During the 10th century, the project was complete, and by that time, no one questioned the idea of calling the new language Hebrew, and no one really noticed how much of the Septuagint content had been left out or changed in the new Chop Chop Old Testament. Sadly, most people back then, and right up to today, refer to that finished Chop Chop book, written in a magic language, 
as the Masoretic Old Testament written in Masoretic Hebrew. That is the so-called Hebrew version, which was later translated into English that King James chose for his new Bible. That chop-chop version of the Old Testament, believe it or not, is the Old Testament version most of our Bibles contain today. You will hear multitudes of people today promote this phony Hebrew. They claim that it is special. They even tell you that learning the language will get you closer to God. And if you listen long enough to what certain of their rabbis say, you'll hear about hidden secrets, secret meanings, secret codes, and supernatural relationships found within the chop-chop version of the Old Testament due to the magic language they made up.